Hey, my name's Paul. I am the education coordinator here at Filmstreams in Omaha, Nebraska. This video is part of Filmstreams' series of educational videos that are dedicated to looking at elements of film and film theory. Uh, my goal here is just to hang out and talk about film, and I hope that sounds cool. Guillermo del Toro has a new film out right now called Nightmare Alley. So to celebrate this well-loved director's new work, I thought we could take a look at the style of Guillermo del Toro. Making movies is uh, eating a sandwich of sh and the only thing that gets a little better is, as the years go by, you get a little more bread. But the shit's always there. Guillermo del Toro is a complex and romantic blend of like comic book nerd, a cinematic mythologist, and monster movie fanatic. And regardless of his film, uh, whether it's uh, The Shape of Water or Blade II, uh, there's a, a very distinct del Torian vibe. And it's pretty clear, I think, by his work that del Toro is inspired by culture. Uh, popular culture, history, religion, these things are all very central to Del Toro's films. And I think that this appreciation for kind of all things like cultural uh, leaves Del Toro wide open as a director to make cool and, and maybe kind of strange decisions. And, and you know, I, I think we all can say we love cool and strange decisions, right? Live people ignore the strange and unusual. I myself am strange and unusual. Yeah, solid, Eddie. A Guillermo del Toro film usually uh, starts off in, in a pretty realistic, normal, and semi-recognizable world. Uh, historical moments that del Toro has explored as settings in his film include uh, the Spanish Civil War, Franco with Spain, the Cold War, and uh, the Victorian era. And, and these are all very real times in, in, in world history. Uh, a del Torian uh, central character, minus a few, uh, very much belong to this real world where the rules are recognizable to most viewers. Uh, these central characters are oftentimes people with relatively little social power, so uh, children without parents, uh, women in times when uh, women aren't fully you know, empowered by society, or maybe people who have been rejected by society, right, outcasts. And as viewers, we can generally recognize and understand like the times, the places, and the things, uh, or the people of a del Toro film. But, however, this sense of normalcy does not last very long. It doesn't take uh, long at all for things in a Del Toro film to start getting weird. <laughs> Very soon, uh, in a Del Toro film, the real uh, or the normal or the mundane uh, is disturbed by an eruption of unreal, supernatural, or dare I say divine. Uh, and the main character and the viewer then are, are tossed into this like other world where the, the real and the unreal have to share space together. And this eruption process is a pretty common uh, narrative like sequence in a Del Toro film. That, that scene is super creepy, but it's, it's classic Del Toro. Uh, the real, this young girl, has to navigate uh, through the unreal, the layer of the pale man. And uh, he's just about as creepy and otherworldly as you can get. And Del Toro does this uh, purposefully. Uh, he places the real and the unreal together to great effect. And there's a lot of symbolism there that really speaks beyond uh, the images on screen. And I'll argue that the monsters in a Guillermo Del Toro film uh, are rarely the scariest things in these narratives. I think we can really see uh, Guillermo del Toro's soul in the way that he uses his monsters. Not all of the monsters are gonna be evil. And in fact, most of the times, uh, the real horrors uh, are gonna come from things like man, uh, humanity, institutions. I think this is kind of a classic fake out. The main character uh, who is symbolic of the real experiences the unreal through these monstrous things. Uh, an imposing fawn, a series of, of gruesome ghosts, a fish dude. And naturally the viewers might think to themselves like, oh, that's a monster. Uh, but I think Del Toro really challenges us to dig deeper and to question the true nature of monstrosity. Because as horrific uh, and gruesome as these monsters might initially appear, it's really their humanity that is much more important to the, the narrative uh, than their monstrosity. And lastly, Guillermo del Toro loves gold. Del Toro colors his films in gilded, amber-hued scenes. It's not a, like a brilliant shining gold either. It's antiqued, it's worn, uh, there's a grittiness to this gold. And I think this color helps ease the viewers into these darker, moodier, and perfect historical settings that Guillermo del Toro loves to explore. Del Toro will cut these warm ambers and golds with a lot of cold blues and sickly greens. And I think the dissonance between these colors creates an interesting, striking scene for the viewers. And I think it definitely adds to that spooky, something's not quite right del Toro mood.
Guillermo del Toro wants people to relate to his films, and he uses relatable or accessible main characters to bring viewers into these worlds. Guillermo del Toro plays around with narrative, and he likes to surprise and shock people. Guillermo del Toro loves monsters, and monsters are not always what they seem. Sometimes the real monsters are the ones who don't look very monstrous at all. Guillermo del Toro's films are steeped in a golden antique hue that adds mood to his scenes. Guillermo del Toro's films might seem, you know, like spooky and fantastical, and they totally are, but I think if we kind of sit with them uh, long enough, we're going to see that they're more complex than that, right? That they are just as much about the real world as they are about fantasy. And I think del Toro tells his stories in really relatable, fantastic, and visually striking ways. Um, okay, cool. I'm going to go rewatch Blade 2. You guys enjoy Nightmare Alley, and we'll talk soon. Blade 2 is a good movie. <laughs>